Hello and welcome to Cloud Learners Journey Part 10 of Azure Administrator Associate Phil Exam Questions and Answers with Explanation and References which you can find in the description. So let's get started. If you like the video, please subscribe to our Cloud Learners Journey YouTube channel to help you pass the AG104 exam and become an Azure Administrator Associate. Question number one. You create an app service plan named Plan 1 and an Azure Web App named Web App 1. You discover that the option to create a staging slot is unavailable. You need to create a staging slot for plan 1. What should you do? And the options are A. From plan 1, scale up the app service plan. B. From web app 1, modify the application settings. C. From web app 1, add a custom domain. D. From plan 1, scale out the app service plan. And the correct option is a. From plan 1, scale up the app service plan. App must be running in the standard, premium or isolated tier in order to enable multiple deployment slots. If the app is not already in the standard, premium or isolated tier, you receive a message that indicates the supported tier for enabling staged publishing. At this point, you have the option to select upgrade. Next, question number 2. You have a general purpose V1 Azure storage account named Storage1 that uses locally redundant storage LRS. You need to ensure that the data in the storage account is protected if a zone fails. The solution must minimize the cost and administrative effort. What should you do first? And the options are A. Create a new storage account B. Configure object replication rules C. Upgrade the account to general purpose V2 D. Modify the replication settings of storage 1. And the correct option is C. Upgrade the account to general purpose V2. General purpose V1 supports GRS or read access GRS but question was about least cost. Least cost is ZRS which is only supported for V2 and premium file or block storage. Next question number 3. You have an Azure subscription that contains a storage account named account 1. You plan to upload the disk files of a virtual machine to account 1 from your on-premises network. The on-premises network uses a public IP address space of 131.107.1.0 forward slash 24. You plan to use the disk files to provision an Azure virtual machine named VM1. VM1 will be attached to a virtual network named VNet1. VNet1 uses an IP address space of 192.168.0.0 forward slash 24. You need to configure account 1 to meet the following requirements. Ensure that you can upload the disk files to account 1. Ensure that you can attach the disks to VM1. Prevent all other access to account 1. Which two actions should you perform? Each correct answer presents the part of the solution. And the options are A. From the networking blade of account 1, select selected networks. B. From the networking blade of account 1, Select Allow Trusted Microsoft Services to access this storage account. C. From the networking blade of account 1, add 131.107.1.0 forward slash 24 IP address range. D. From the networking blade of account 1, add VNet1. E. From the service endpoints blade of VNet1, add a service endpoint. And the correct options are A. From the networking blade of account 1, select selected networks. E. From the service endpoints blade of VNet1, add a service endpoint. By default, storage accounts accept connections from clients on any network. To limit access to selected networks, you must first change the default action and also by enabling a service endpoint for Azure storage within the virtual network. Traffic is ensured an optimal route to the Azure storage service. Next, question number 4. Your company's Azure solution makes use of multi-factor authentication for when users are not in the office. The per authentication option has been configured as the usage model. After the acquisition of a smaller business and the addition of a new staff to Azure Active Directory, obtains a different company and adding a new employees to Azure Active Directory. You are informed that these employees should also make use of multi-factor authentication. To achieve this, per enabled user setting must be set for the usage model. Here the solution is, you create a new multi-factor authentication provider with a backup from the existing multi-factor authentication provider data. Does this meet the goal? And the options are A, yes, B, no. And the correct option is B, no. 
Existing authorization providers may continue to be used and updated, but migration is no longer possible. Next, question number five. Your company's Azure solution makes use of multi-factor authentication for when users are not in the office. The per authentication option has been configured as the usage model. After the acquisition of a smaller business and the addition of the new staff to Azure Active Directory, Azure AD obtains a different company and adding the new employees to Azure Active Directory. You are informed that these employees should also make use of multi-factor authentication. To achieve this, per enable user setting must be set for the usage model. It is the same as uh, previous question, but the solution here is different. And the solution is, you reconfigure the existing usage model via the Azure CLI. Does the solution meet the goal? Options are A, yes, B, no, and the correct option is B, no. You cannot change the usage model after an MFA provider is created. Next, question number six. This is the same as the previous question. Here, the solution is different. You reconfigure the existing usage model via the Azure portal. Does the solution meet the goal? And the options are A, yes, B, no. And the correct answer is B, no. It is similar to the previous question. You cannot change the usage model after an MFA provider is created. Next, question number seven. Your company has an Azure Active Directory tenant that is configured for hybrid coexistence with the on-premise Active Directory domain. The on-premise virtual environment consists of virtual machines running on Windows Server 2012 R2 Hyper-V host servers. You have created some PowerShell scripts to automate the configuration of newly created VMs. You plan to create several new VMs. You need a solution that ensures the scripts are run on the new VMs. Which of the following is the best solution? And the options are A. Configure a setup complete.cmd patch file in the percentile windier which is a Windows directory backward slash setup backward slash script directory. B. Configure a group policy object GPO to run the scripts as logon scripts. C. Configure a group policy objects GPO to run the scripts as startup scripts. D. Place the scripts in a new virtual hard disk VHD. And the correct option is A. Configure a setup complete.cmd patch file in the Windows directory backward slash setup backward slash script directory. We have three alternatives for this. First, after you deploy a virtual machine, you typically need to make some changes before it's ready to use. This is something you can do manually. And second, you could use Remote PowerShell to automate the configuration of your VM after deployment. Third, Custom Script Execution will allow to customize the VM. The Custom Script Execution is executed by the VM agent and it's very straightforward. You specify which file it needs to download from your storage account, which file it needs to execute. You can even specify arguments that need to be passed to the script. The only requirement is that you execute a .ps1 file. Next, question number 8. Your company has two on-premise servers named SRV01 and SRV02. Developers have created an application that runs on SRV01. The application calls a service on SRV02 by IP address. You plan to migrate the application on Azure Virtual Machines. You have configured two VMs on a single subnet in an Azure Virtual Network. You need to configure the two VMs with static internal IP address. What should you do? And the options are A. Run the new hyphen Azure RM VM config partial commandlet. B. Run the set hyphen Azure subnet partial commandlet. C. Modify the VM properties in the Azure management portal. D. Modify the IP properties in Windows Network and Sharing Center. E. Run the set hyphen Azure static VNet IP partial commandlet. And the option is E. Run the set hyphen Azure static VNet IP partial commandlet. If you want to set a static IP address for the VM that you previously created, you can do so by using this commandlet. If you already set an IP address for the VM and you want to change to a different IP address, you will need to remove the existing static IP address before running these commandlets. Next, question number 9. You have a Microsoft 365 tenant and an Azure Active Directory tenant named Contoso.com. You plan to grant three users named User1, User2 and User3 access to a temporary Microsoft SharePoint document library named Library1. You need to create groups for the users. The solution must ensure that the groups are deleted automatically after 180 days. Which two groups should you create? Each correct answer presents a complete solution. 
and the options are a Microsoft 365 group that uses the assigned membership type B security group that uses the assigned membership type C Microsoft 365 group that uses the dynamic user membership type D security group that uses the dynamic user membership type E a security group that uses the dynamic device membership type and the correct options are a Microsoft 365 group that uses the assigned membership type and C Microsoft 365 group that uses the dynamic user membership type. You can set expiration policy only for Office 365 groups in Azure Active Directory. Next, question number 10. You have the Azure management groups shown in the following table. Column names, name and the management group. We have the tenant root group. Management group 11 is a member of tenant root group. Management group 12 is a member of tenant root group. Management group 21 is a member of management group 11. You add Azure subscriptions to the management groups as shown in the following table. We have the columns name management group. Subscription 1 is a member of management group 21. Subscription 2 is a member of management group 12. You create the Azure policies shown in the following table. We have the columns name, parameter, scope. The name is not allowed resource type with parameter for virtual networks and the scope is for tenant root group. And the other one name allowed resource types with parameters for virtual networks and scope is for management group 12. For each of the following statements select yes if the statement is true otherwise select no. Here we see the statements for the first statement you can create a virtual network in subscription 1 and the option is no. Tenant root group has not allowed resource types for virtual networks which is indirect member of subscription 1 hence the answer is no. And second statement, you can create a virtual machine in subscription 2 and the option is no. We cannot create a VM because based on the policy, you can only create VNets in subscription 2 which is a member of management group 12. Third statement, you can add subscription 1 to a management group 11 and the option is no. You cannot add subscription 1 to a management group 11 but you can move subscription 1 from management group 21 to management group 11. Subscriptions can only be a member of one management group at a time. Next, question number 11. You recently created a new Azure subscription that contains a user named admin1. Admin1 attempts to deploy an Azure Marketplace resource by using an Azure Resource Manager template. Admin1 deploys the template by using Azure PowerShell and receives the following error message. User failed validation to a purchase resources. Error message, legal terms have not been accepted for this item on this subscription. To accept legal terms, please go to the Azure portal http colon forward slash forward slash go dot microsoft dot com forward slash fw link forward slash question mark link id equal to 534873 and configure programmatic deployment for the marketplace item or create it there for the first time. You need to ensure that admin one can deploy the marketplace resource successfully. What should you do? And the options are a from Azure PowerShell run the set hyphen az api management subscription commandlet. B from the Azure portal register the Microsoft.marketplace resource provider. C from Azure PowerShell run the set hyphen az marketplace terms commandlet. And the correct option is C from Azure PowerShell run the set hyphen az marketplace terms commandlet. Set hyphen az marketplace terms commandlet accepts or rejects terms for a given publisher ID. Offer ID and Plan ID. To get the agreement terms, use get hyphen az marketplace terms. Next, question number 12. You have an Azure subscription that contains a resource group named RG26. RG26 is set to the West Europe location and is used to create temporary resources for a project. RG26 contains the resource shown in the following table. Column names, name, type, location. VM1 is in North Europe location, RGV1 which is a recovery service vault in North Europe location, SQL D01 which is a SQL server in Azure VM is in North Europe location, SA001 which is a storage account in West Europe location. SQL DB01 is backed up to a RGV1. When the project is complete, you attempt to delete RG26 from the Azure portal. The deletion fails. You need to delete RG26. What should you do first? And the options are A. Delete VM1 B. Stop VM1 C. Stop the backup of SQL DB01 
D. Delete SA001. And the correct option is C. Stop the backup of SQL DB01. VMs running or not, it would not block the deletion of a resource group. Also, storage accounts do not block the deletion of a resource group. The only option is backup is still running and activity is going on. Hence, we need to stop backup of SQL DB01. Next, question number 13. You have an Azure subscription named subscription 1. Subscription 1 contains the resource groups in the following table. We have the columns name, Azure region and the policy. RG1 is in West Europe region with policy, policy 1. RG2 is in North Europe region with policy 2. RG3 is in France Central region with policy 3. RG1 has a web app named web app 1. Web app 1 is located in West Europe. You move web app 1 to RG2. What is the effect of the move? And the options are A. The app service plan for web app 1 remains in West Europe. Policy 2 applies to web app 1. B. The app service plan for web app 1 moves to North Europe. Policy 2 applies to web app 1. C. The app service plan for web app 1 remains in West Europe. Policy 1 applies to web app 1. D. The app service plan for web app 1 moves to North Europe. Policy 1 applies to web app 1. And the correct option is A. The app service plan for web app 1 remains in West Europe. Policy 2 applies to web app 1. You can move an app to another app service plan as long as the source plan and the target plan are in the same resource group and geographical region. The region in which your app runs is the region of the app service plan it's in. However, you cannot change an app service plan's region. Next, question number 14. You have an Azure Active Directory tenant. You need to create a conditional access policy that requires all users to use multi-factor authentication when they access the Azure portal. Which three settings should you configure? To answer, select the appropriate settings in the answer area. In the answer area, we see name, policy 1 and the assignments, users and groups and with zero users and groups selected. Cloud apps with zero cloud apps selected. Conditions, zero conditions selected. Also, we see below access controls with grant, zero control selected and the session. And correct settings are under assignment, users and group cloud apps under access controls grant multi-factor authentication is a process in which a user is prompted for additional forms of identification during a sign-in event for example the prompt could be to enter a code on their cell phone or to provide a fingerprint scan when you require a second form of identification security is increased because this additional factor isn't easy for an attacker to obtain or duplicate next question number 15 you have an Azure subscription that contains a storage account named Storage1. The subscription is linked to an Azure Active Directory tenant named Contusor.com that syncs to an on-premises Active Directory domain. The domain contains the security principles shown in the following table. Here we see the columns, name and the type, User1 and Computer1. In Azure AD, you create a user named User2. The Storage1 account contains a file share named Share1 and has the following configurations. Here we see the kind, storage v2 and the properties, Azure Files Identity Based Authentication, Directory Service Options as AD, Active Directory Properties, Domain Name Contestor.com, NetBias Domain Name Contestor.com, Forest Name Contestor.com. For each of the following statements, select Yes if the statement is true, otherwise select No. In the statement, for the first one, you can assign the storage file data SMB share contributor role to user1 first share1 and the option is yes because user1 is a hybrid user. Second statement, you can assign the storage file data SMB share reader role to computer1 first share1 and the correct option is no because only user can be assigned that role. Third statement, you can assign the storage file data SMB share elevated contributor role to user2 first share1 and the correct option is no because user2 is created on Azure, not in Windows Active Directory and therefore is not a hybrid. To be hybrid, it must be created on-premises in Windows Active Directory and then be synchronized using Azure AD Connect. To be in hybrid, it must be created on-premises in Windows Active Directory and then be synchronized using Azure AD Connect. Here we end with part 10. Thank you for watching part 10 of Azure Administrator Associate Real Exam Questions and Answers. We hope you found it informative and helpful. If you liked the video, Please like, share and subscribe to our channel and comment for more related topics. We look forward to continuing the journey with you in next videos. Thank you.